So in this video, I'll be discussing about squilling test. Squilling test is not done routinely. So though there are many MCQs in USMLE and also Indian Medical PG entrance examinations, the skilling test, when you go to a clinical practice, you will never order this as a doctor. But still, why they are asking questions from it? If you understand the skilling test, it is easy for you to understand the methods or the mechanism involved in absorption of vitamin B12. So what is your first take home? It is not done routinely. But if you do a skilling test, it helps you in differentiating these four major diseases which cause vitamin B12 deficiency. One is pernicious anemia, second one is chronic pancreatitis, third is bacterial overgrowth and fourth is ileal disease. There is one more variety called achlorhydria. So in this, you have to just modify this test. So at the end of the discussion, I'll also tell you what is that modification you need to do to identify achlorhydria. Let us begin now then. In skilling test, what are the requirements? Okay, you need to take oral so this is how you give it oral and there is one more variant im intramuscular the cobalamin variant which is given orally is radioactive labeled with the help of cobalt so radioactive labeled cobalamin okay this is what we use im we give normal cobalamin we give normal cobalamin and dose is 1 mg these are the requirements next we'll go to principle behind this when I say principle, you need to understand one thing. Food contains cobalamin. Okay. And along with the cobalamin, we also have proteins surrounding it. This is acted upon by hydrochloric acid so that you will there is a release of cobalamin from the food material. Once it is released, this cobalamin is bind to R binding protein. What is this? It is bound to R binding protein. So this is acted upon by this is act up, acted upon by pancreatic enzymes or pancreatic proteases or trypsin we call it otherwise and once it acts there is release of cobalamin okay and this cobalamin binds with intrinsic factor what is the need for its bind i am not writing minus sign here why it is important for intrinsic factor to bind to cobalamin because to prevent bacterial usage to prevent bacterial usage and this molecule now enters into where does it go it enters into ileal ileal epithelial cell this is how absorption occurs with the help of skilling task you can identify at which location or which step there are issues with vitamin B12 absorption. So it only tells you the vitamin B12 absorption defects. Vitamin B12 absorption defects. So we are discussing the principal part and in the principle you know the different steps. Now when I give dietary cobalamin most of it is used up by the cells and it is stored it is stored inside the liver some amount is excreted into the bile okay some amount is excreted into the bile and some amount is excreted through the urine now you see if i give excess cobalamin excess cobalamin then what happens you can observe this cobalamin into the urine because it's getting wasted to load up body with excess vitamin b12 what we are doing in the procedure of skilling we are giving IM or intramuscular vitamin B12 injection 1 mg. So this will load up the body so that whatever oral radioactive cobalamin that is the cobalt labeled radioactive cobalamin whatever we are giving is now excreted through the urine. So what you have to do you have to collect the urine for the next 24 hours of this experiment and Try to measure the radioactive element that is radioactive cobalamin presence inside the urine sample. Normally, in the excretion part, you will see like around more than 10% of excretion of cobalamin. Why it is getting excreted? Because it is getting absorbed. It is getting absorbed. That is the reason it is getting excreted into the urine. If there is any absorptive defect, you will not see more than 10% excretion of radioactive labeled cobalt. 
or cobalamin. Now what happens? You will see less than 10%. So less than 10% excretion in 24-hour urine sample is abnormal. So in the following diseases, when I say there is reduced level, it means it, they are excreting less than 10%. See, in the four options, less than 10%. Now, once you know the reduced levels, the next experiment, the second experiment after some time, we have to supplement the same oral and also IM cobalamin with intrinsic factor. In pernicious anemia, in pernicious anemia, there is defect with intrinsic factor. And once you give intrinsic factor, the levels become normal. That is now there is more than 10% excretion. In case of chronic pancreatitis, as we are discussing pancreatic enzymes are important for release of the dietary cobalamin from R binding protein, right? So if there is pancreatic deficiency, you will see reduced uh, exper first experiment or first test. So if you give pancreatic enzyme, the patient responds and he'll become normal. In case of bacterial overgrowth, as we all know, intrinsic factor binds to the cobalamin so that the available dietary cobalamin is not used by the intestinal bacteria. In case of bacterial overgrowth or blind loop syndrome, what happens when you give five days of antibiotics, usually we give, we give tetracyclines. So when we give five doses of antibiotics, what happens? The patient responds and the test becomes normal. Even after doing all these three stuffs, intrinsic factor supplementation or pancreatic enzyme supplementation or five days of antibiotics, even after doing all this stuff, if the patient still has reduced levels of cobalt cobalamin in the urine, so the patient might be suffering with the ileum because it is the ileal mucosa which is taking in the dietary cobalamin plus intrinsic factor. So these are the four things. As I told you, I'll add on the fifth thing, what happens in echlorhydria? While I'm teaching you the principles, I told you the first step is dietary cobalamin binds to proteins which are present in the food. So here I'm giving oral cobalt cobalamin, right? Let me add proteins also. So I'll mix this oral cobalt cobalamin with a scrambled egg because scrambled egg contains proteins. So because I'm doing this, this is overcoated with proteins in the modified skilling experiment. So the same procedure, but instead of giving it a plain oral, I'm adding scrambled egg so that I can coat it with the proteins. So if the patient is having echlorhydria, the final result is less than 10% excretion. So in echlorhydria, rest all are normal, but still you will see reduced levels because of addition of scrambled eggs. So this is what happens in echlorhydria. So let me sum up. A skilling test is done mainly to identify or to differentiate different causes of vitamin B12 deficiency that to exclusively concerned with absorption of vitamin B12.